So we'd encourage you to find your seats as quickly as possible. Um, lunch is soon, and you can continue your conversations. Um, and also, we're going to darken the room, so it's good if you can find your seat. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, before we start uh, the presentation, uh, just a warning um, that there are some strobe lighting effects in the presentation that will be presented. It's not often and it's not long, uh, but if it comes up, just so that you know, to close your eyes if you're sensitive to that. Um, but can we all just be seated, please? Uh, we'll talk in the room, and I'll hand over to The Voice. One thousand days. The future of humanity's urban, and increasingly humanity's urban future, is the future of African cities. One thousand days. Take Nigeria. Urban growth in the continent's largest economy is massive. By 2050, Nigeria will be the third most populous nation on earth, with 212 million more people living in its cities. 80% of that growth will be beyond state control, and 75% of Nigeria's urbanites will be under the age of 24. This much we know. The future of African cities is both demographically and infrastructurally young. This future will unfold through the permanent emergency of a deepening climate crisis. 1,000 days. According to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, we have 1,000 days to ensure that carbon emissions peak, 1,000 days to change the course of the continent's urban trajectory, 1,000 days to shift the course of planetary civilization so that between 2025 and 2030, we see a reduction of emissions by 37%, avoiding further catastrophic climate disruption impacts. We need infrastructure fit for a future that we can inhabit, and not humans only. How to imagine such a future? How to imagine such infrastructure? Superheroes. We're facing almost unimaginable scenarios for the future. Overwhelming, terrifying, exhilarating by turns. Is it extreme frivolity to speculate about our urban futures through the fiction of a fantasy franchise? I'm arguing that to soberly imagine that business as usual is feasible, that our profit-driven formulas will deliver our received notion of bankable salvation is truly fantastical. Here's a special preview of the Afro-Urban Superhero League created just for you here today. <laughs>
Perhaps superheroes will fly us beyond the failing language of feasibility. Certainly, they can help us loosen up our imaginations and describe two scenarios, one of which, far from being unreal, is our most likely condition in the near future. It is already contemporary reality in many places for many people. The other scenario, well, we must realize if we are to survive, and that is literally a superhuman task, because it will involve the more than human, as we must draw deeply on many nature-based approaches to urban challenges. Bringing the future into focus is perhaps an impossible task, but bringing the futures of African cities into focus is nonetheless an urgent task. In this process, our fantasies matter. The glossy brochures, the 3D renders, the pitch decks, the intricate scale models, and, of course, our desires, even if disguised in the sober discourse of governance, management, engineering. Too often, the urban futures we desire are, in truth, someone else's ill-fitting fantasies, obsolete models, fossil fuel-soaked fossils. In Africa, there is too often a violent disconnect between the borrowed urban fantasies of our political class and the urban realities of the majority who are, in their daily enterprises of survival, actually shaping the face of our cities. So let's just look at some fantasy scenes, also created just for you, and see what we recognize. Indeed, we need to confront the material realities of our urban fantasies, both our dreams and our nightmares. Amitav Ghosh claims, those at the margins are now the first to experience the future that awaits all of us. We understand that the margin is already wider than the page. Either one rewrites the story of future African cities in the idiom of contemporary youth-driven informality, or one loses the plot. The future is now. Unless we rewrite it, these are the infrastructures 
of the future. As Africans, we have the opportunity to fundamentally remake our economies and societies, imagine different futures. Our massive service infrastructure deficit must be seized as an opportunity to envisage radically new and more sustaining development trajectories. Unburdened by extractivism, colonialism and violence, an opportunity to experiment with approaches that draw on improvisatory, adaptive, and often makeshift dynamics of self-built neighborhoods, to catalyze expanding networks of lightweight, low-cost, on-site community infrastructures and social services embedded in neighborhood association and governance. We need to develop different relationships with materials, valorize earth over concrete, sustainable plant-based materials over steel, nurture nature-based infrastructures. We need to move beyond an urban metabolism based on energy-intensive, resource-heavy, supermassive fixed infrastructures designed to support unsupportable levels of materials consumption. To bring about this future, we need to anticipate it, while simultaneously rooting our anticipatory visions deeply in existing urban fabric. Here's a visual exercise in anticipating a different future. Lightweight, distributed, meso-level infrastructures are well suited to negotiating the often makeshift patchwork of many African cities. They have the capacity to be at once highly responsive to hyperlocal conditions 
and to interconnect in ways that allow them to run across localities and achieve citywide coverage. In 1977, Dennis Hayes claimed that dispersed solar sources are more compatible than centralized technologies with social equity, freedom, and cultural pluralism. Our physical infrastructures will not determine our architectures of governance, but their forms should rhyme. We've seen many images of solar networked and wind systems. Here's a render of a modular hydrogen power kiosk dropped into an underserved area. The responsiveness of this approach is key, a mobile unit. Our cities are growing much faster than sites and services approaches can cope with. A responsive and adaptive model is critical. We already do this for events, concerts, massive church services. Much of African urban landscape is now a ceaseless series of events. Neighborhood-based social enterprises can run off-grid hubs and not only generate electricity, but also perform routine maintenance and repair functions. Inevitably, however, there will be massive on-grid modalities at region, national levels. But increasingly, those solutions will be integrated into the very fabric of the city. Our cities will be generators, not merely consumers of energy. Rapidly deployable, modularized, plant-based filtration and aquacultural units can be inserted into dense urban contexts. But infrastructures here are perhaps less about discrete units and more about hydrological systems, about landscapes that can facilitate natural filtration, mitigating flooding and creating opportunities for sustainable organic farming and smallholder farmers. Of course, there'll be lots of cool African-based renewably powered vehicle innovation small, quiet, agile, even impossibly small and cool. But we shouldn't fetishize vehicles. Urban mobility is not only about electric vehicles. The question is not only what kind of wheels will move us from one place to another, but also how we make places so that we don't have to move so far or so fast. Urban mobility is very much about urban form and feet and bicycles. We need to design and build spaces that are dense and richly various. This is indeed the way that many self-built communities are already designed, and this is a virtue. So finally, I want to take us on a brief archaeology of the future. In these excavations, we can perhaps make out a way back to the future. Our collective forms of urban life will determine all planetary life. Cities account for more than 70% of global carbon emissions in one form or another. African cities can become teeming sites of infrastructural innovation and institutional design, flourishing grounds for regenerative urban ecosystems where we experiment with novel legal architectures and forms of governance through which we steer ourselves towards more just and sustaining economic relationships and a net zero metabolic rate for our collective life. This will be a struggle. The challenges seem overwhelming. A neighborhood absent of any basic service infrastructures and still growing. No scope for large-scale interventions. Start small, modular, interoperable, lightweight, distributed systems and nature-based elements allow for rapid, impactful interventions. Implementation of interconnectable solar mini-grids, neighborhood mesh networks, street greenery, community food gardens consolidated neighborhood with wind turbines now sending power back to the grid. The grid itself can be made from a network of these neighborhoods. Scaling is not reliant on a pre-existing mega infrastructure. The next big thing is a concert of small things. The route to citywide scale is the connection of neighborhood scale systems and subsystems, large vertical farms, aquaculture facilities, parks, sports spaces, alongside elements of rammed earth vertical housing. Imagine this logic unfolding in an already intensively industrialized context, high capacity renewable energy components and ecosystems remediation. Very soon, we find ourselves in the future. We've already entered a new geological age, and one in which it is increasingly difficult to imagine a future. But imagine we must. The future could look very different indeed.
Thank you, Michael. Um, the production was put together by Michael Wemendimo that will also join the panel in a short while and share tomorrow some of the, the community mapping work and other activities that they do as part of CMAP and Chikoko Radio. Um, I want to now uh, invite a very special and dear friend who is always happy to roll up his sleeves, roll up his uh, pants, his trouser pants, and get into the mud and into the fight. Um, Hastings Chikoko is an advisory board member of the ACC, but also a leader in the climate fight as the Africa head of C40 and as the head of the International Relations Division of C40 Global. Um, Hastings will introduce his panel, and uh, um, I just want to remind you as the session unfolds to dig into your conference bag, pull out the questions we've left there for you, uh, engage with them, doodle on them, um, and can the other panelists please join us now? Um, uh, I've got, let me just remind myself, uh, unfortunately it's not memorized in my head. Uh, Regina? Uh, and Azizat and Muhammad, um, can you join the panel, please? And Michael. Hastings, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar, and uh, really welcome back and uh, good afternoon. Wow, Michael, where are you? What a story. I think I'm not asking for too much. Can we give Michael another round of applause? I walked through that journey, and uh, really what um, struck me is about the phrase, just the phrase that the future is now. If at all we are to safeguard the future of our planet or our economies, we need to take action now. And the urban superheroes of Africa must implement the visions and commitments and strategies that we are good at uh, coming up with. This particular session and panel would like to focus on how we implement sustainable infrastructure transitions in Africa. And Michael has started very well with the bringing the voice of action into this conversation. But I am joined here with uh, colleagues who actually are at the forefront of implementation to bring additional voices uh, in terms of how we can translate the visions and strategies and plans and aspirations and commitments into implementable action that makes material difference. I spent two weeks at COP27 and I told Edgar yesterday that I come here with, uh, full of disillusionment. And I'm hoping that this particular conversation that we're going to have this afternoon will give me hope. And uh, we will stop dancing to so much trouble in this world to jamming. Jamming, I want to jam up with you. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason why Carlos did not get some good moves, because the song itself is not, does not invite good moves, but when we transition to jamming, it will be good news. Why I was disillusioned is, colleagues, COP27, the 27 simply means that we have been meeting and discussing for 27 years. And in those 27 years, we have been agreeing on solutions and what needs to be done. But when we look at uh, the problem we're trying to address, the emissions are not picking, the impacts of climate change are intensifying, the nationally determined contributions are lacking ambition. There is one two possibilities here. Either the solutions that we agree are not uh, good enough, or 
we agree and we don't implement. And this is why I have this panel. How do we implement? Mampela, Carlos, Joe, and Mark have done a fantastic job in the first panel by outlining the macro level changes that Africa needs to transform. How do we receive that, colleagues, and get it down to where the rubber hits the road and implement? That's the conversation that I would like us to have. And I would like to call upon my colleagues here. I'll start with Muhammad, first name, best is here. It's informal conversation. Muhammad, I would like you to just uh, take the floor. This session will be very visual. I would like to take the floor, and in uh, seven to nine minutes, I would like you to just share with us in terms of the housing infrastructure in Africa. How do we implement so that we, do, we, we depart from shortcuts where people are defaulting to having makeshift and informal settlements? And you're saying, no, this is not the future. The future is now, and we need to have better housing infrastructure. Take it from there. Can you just share with us what you're doing at Short Africa? Thank you, Hastings. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure being part of this uh, panel session. Very engaging, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing what we do at um, Active the Shelter Africa, the challenges and trajectory, and of course, the inter kind of disciplinary engagement within the built environment, climate change, cities, and what needs to be done to achieve a social economic development. I talked about the agenda 2063, uh, SDGs 2030, when we're already in the decade of action. We need to walk the talk and we need to deliver on these goals. So uh, moving on to have um, a, a, a kind of a short presentation, please help me with the slides pointer. So um, a lot has been said already in the aspects uh, relating to the trajectory of uh, urbanization in Africa, where we are, where we're heading to, what needs to be done, and of course, the impact of cities, climate change, and the, 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 the future engagements within the built environment. It's glaring. I don't have to really kind of stress this point uh, any further. Well, of the challenges and, of course, the need for urgent actions going forward. Um, this is kind of, you know, an overview of the interacting challenges covering from North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and, and how it impacts the climate agenda and where, what needs to be done to achieve the goals of sustainable development related to the climate change agenda. In Morocco, we have seen the challenges of climate risk infrastructure affecting hydropower capacity. In, in, in Zambia, we have seen the effect in Tanzania. So it cuts across. So that really kind of, that we shouldn't look and consider uh, climate change in isolation, it cuts across the 17 goals of SDGs and of course, the, our trajectory for social economic development. Um, but of course, for us to kind of move forward and to achieve that objective of climate change within the built environment, we need to understand that the fact that buildings play a very important and critical role in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. According to IPCC report, by 2030, buildings only the buildings must be net zero carbon. And of course, by 2050, there has to be achieved that goal. But of, uh, the challenge is, why are we in Africa? What are the potentials? And how can we be able to achieve this goal? According to figures by the IFC, there's an estimated opportunity of almost $800 billion in terms of green infrastructure, because all are aware of the fact that most of the cities that need to be built in Africa, they're not yet there. So there is a potential for us to go green, to you know, kind of potentialize on those opportunities going forward. Um, there's a recent progress in terms of you know, the transition in the built environment relating to climate adaptation and resilience. But of course, more needs to be done. For instance, in Kenya, there has been the cross-cutting engagement with the, the, the development plans of uh, aligned to the Vision 2030. And also, that kind of pinpoints the need for all large-scale housing construction building uh, projects, they need to be green, globally green certified. So that is kind of a movement. That's a, an achievement. But of course, I'll highlight the challenges, I'll highlight the issues, and the way forward. For instance, in Nigeria also, recently, the Climate Change Act was, was, was passed. And that was the first Climate Change Act across West Africa. So that really talks to you know, the progress being made across African countries. But there are challenges, there are issues, and more needs to be done. And we need to be practical, we need to be hands-on. 
Um, one of the key issues that need to be considered is that most of these templates and standards that we know, we talk about certifications, talk about you know, uh, 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 green building uh, requirements, they are adopted from the global north. And they do not align with the realities, with socioeconomic dynamics that we do have in Africa. We don't have the skills, the capacities, and the technological you know, know-how to implement the standards. And of course, another aspect that needs to be considered is the awareness in terms of the stakeholders, the public sector, the private sector, you know, what are their roles or responsibilities? There are laws out there, there are regulations, there are new requirements, but people are not really carried along in terms of understanding what needs to be done to drive this agenda. And uh, this was also made mention earlier, the availability of finance. That's very, very important. Coming from my field, uh, from a DFI into, uh, into affordable housing delivery across Africa, when we engage with developers, they said, okay, we need to go green. We need to really, you know, walk the talk. But the financing, that's where the issue is. The challenge remains walking the talk in terms of financing. So this was already highlighted in the previous session. So I think that's a key area that needs to be considered. And of course, I have the progress there in COP, I can see, yes, there's an aspect in terms of loss and damage, but the as aspect relating to mitigation, adaptation also needs to be considered. So that's very, very important. More needs to be done to and achieve and deliver these uh, objectives. And also lastly, in terms of the challenges, data is very, very important. Ab open data, availability, sharing data. We need to really share ideas, thoughts, you know, what are the lessons learned? I think that will go a long way in enhancing uh, delivery of climate resilient infrastructure in Africa. So introduce, of course, just uh, uh, briefly what we do at Shelter Africa. It's a Pan-African has no financial institution uh, created 40 years ago with the sole mandate of enhancing eradication of slums and affordable housing delivery across Africa. So that this, 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 this mandate, we can see it just kind of looking at it holistically, only talks to cover. SDG number 11, sustainable cities and communities. But if we look at it holistically, it cuts across the 17 goals because there's climate action to it, there's partnerships to it, there's enhanced educational outcomes. Once people, they are well sheltered, they have quality housing, that will go a long way in achieving their goals of social economic development. Just as an overview of products uh, that the institution offers, cutting across both the demand and supply sides of housing. Because housing is a value chain, we can look at it in kind of uh, in silos, there has to be that value chain engagement, attending both to demand and supply sides. And then of course, the commitment of the institution in terms of uh, sustainability, in terms of climate action. There's a partnership uh, with Shelter Africa and IFC through the EDGE, that's, that's the Excellence in Design for Greater Efficiency, which aims to enhance sustainability uh, housing delivery across Africa. The whole objective of EDGE it's the reduction in energy and water consumption and energy embedded in materials. So by adopting this template, we expect to really deliver the goals of sustainable and urban housing delivery in Africa, where the deficit estimated, where the data is also a challenge, but estimated more than getting to around 80 million. And it's growing by the day. We have seen the impact of COVID in housing, and of course, what needs to be done in terms of affordable and efficient qualitative housing delivery in Africa. So just as I kind of conclude the presentation, case studies of interventions, you know, of course we have talked about the challenges, the issues, but it's not all uh, kind of doom. There are progress being made. There are case studies of, you know, success across African countries, which can be replicated, you know, across the continent. For instance, in Nairobi, Kenya, the Institute of Shelter Africa provided financing to Econ uh, student accommodation, which was the first there in, in, in Kenya in terms of providing qualitative student accommodation in the country. And one important area that needs to be considered is that in 2019, this housing, uh, this student accommodation led to the first Kenya Fed Green Bond, up to uh, almost 40 million USD. That is the first and almost one of the few across Africa. And also it led to the first student accommodation real estate investment trust, which is edge certified. So these are ideas, these are innovations that we have delivered, but of course there are challenges. And it needs to be replicated, it needs to be you know, adopted across African countries. And then another financing through uh, Landmark, which is based in Nigeria, 
um, uh, uh, they're into a kind of a large scale um, housing, leisure, tourism facilities. So through their sustainability initiatives, they have adopted renewable energy solutions, they have adopted effective ventilation and uh, cooling systems, anaerobic digester, rainwater harvesting. So, and, and we believe, you know, um, um, it is doable, it's, it's, it's applicable, despite the challenges, despite the issues, and of course the impact through this investment and through this engagement and at Landmark Africa based in Nigeria, they have delivered this number of job creation. They have delivered an impact through education, which is a collaboration with the Massacre Foundation. So what we are saying is that um, aspects relating to housing, cities, you know, we should look at it as one kind of in, in, in silo engagement. It, we need to look at it holistically. And of course, by having this clear conversation in terms of financing, in terms of you know, um, being frank, being hands-on and practical, I think that will go a long way in achieving the set objectives. So with this, I'd like to say thank you, and then um, looking forward to further engagements as we go on with the, uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Muhammad. You know, um, the building sector or building infrastructure does provide solutions to both climate mitigation and resilience in our cities. When you look at the greenhouse gas inventories, you find that uh, the building sector really does contribute a lot, uh, around 40, at least 40 percent. But also when you look at uh, Pakistan, when you look at uh, what happened in Nigeria, you saw what happened to the makeshift building infrastructure after the floods. That's where we have uh, really maximum uh, uh, kind of like vulnerability. And uh, we need to really have a conversation after this to see how do we upscale, how do we replicate this. Uh, when you look at the building infrastructure, it's also about uh, really ensuring that there is clean construction so that we avoid embed, embed, uh, embodied emissions, but also we improve efficiencies. Uh, we, we have really efficient buildings. And uh, I, it's on that that I would like us to transition to energy infrastructure. Because um, when you look at these buildings and you look at efficient en efficiency, energy is key to en ensuring that we have that efficiency. And Aziz, I'm coming to you because you are implementing a no-nonsense project. Because basically you are saying, if we are to deal with this problem, there is no space for fossil fuels in the sector. It has to be 100% renewable energy. Could you please just tell us more about what we're doing and uh, really the solutions, the practical solutions that we have to ensure clean and renewable energy in African cities? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hastings. Um, so um, currently there's a project going on it's called the 100% Renewable Cities and Regions Project. It's implemented by ECLI in a number of countries, in three countries specifically, Kenya, Indonesia, and Argentina. So what we are doing along this project is to foster the uptake of renewable energy and of course energy efficiency in different sectors across the economy. So we're focusing for now on three cities within Kenya, that's Kisumu County, and then we have um, Nairobi, sorry, we have um, Nakuru County and uh, Mombasa as learning cities under this project. It started in 2019 and it's um, on until 2023 and there's a phase two which we're envisioning. So along um, the line of developing the projects, one of the object, the main goal is to, as I said, to increase the uptake of renewable energy to up to 100% by 2050. Along this line, there are a number of other objectives which we intend to meet. And one of those really important to this, apart from increasing access to electricity and reducing dependence on fossil fuels and increasing and um, reducing electricity costs for residences, for public institutions, and for commercial organizations, we also seek to um, identify lo local policy developments um, at the counties we are working with, working with, and then also seek how we can you know, multiply this across the other counties along um, within Kenya, for instance. So the project has achieved a number of things so far. It's still an ongoing project. There are still lessons being learned. There are still a number of things we are, we are doing. 
But so far, one of the things that we've done to, as the start of the project at the national level was to develop a national energy situational um, stakeholder analysis report. We identified the stakeholders, who are the people that are critical to this transition, at what stage in the process of transitioning to an increase in IRE uptake would each of these stakeholders come on board. Then, in addition to engaging the national level, we've also set up a national policy, uh, national project advisory group. So this project advisory group is made up of stakeholders from the Ministry of Energy, the um, Council of Governors, the um, Kenyan KPLC, Kenyan Power um, Liability Company, um, um, and a number of stakeholders also from the Housing and Urban Development Department. So what this project advisory group does is to advise us as we're moving along, okay, we want to, we're thinking of these actions, we're thinking of this project to develop them into bankable proposals. They advise us and guide us along the line, which other stakeholders do we need to bring on board, which other actions do we need to make sure that we're able to get to this level of having uh, more cities, uh, more communities within the project it is um, increase their uptake of renewable energy. And um, in addition to that, we've also had the multi-level governance dialogue workshop. This way we're trying to bring um, stakeholders, not just from the local level, also from the national level, like from the ministries I mentioned earlier, devolution, energy, urban development, bring all the stakeholders on. But so we're not just seeing it from a county's perspective, we're also getting the national level input on how to push this um, project forward. So the multi-level uh, multi governance dialogue workshop also had stakeholders from the private sector also bringing in their angle to, okay, what are some of the challenges you are likely to and, um, um, co come across based on their own experience. And what we are trying to do is to, not just at the final stage of maybe we are getting a proposal already, that's where we now bring in these stakeholders, we are trying to bring them in as the project progresses, right from identifying the project. Is this um, action something that's going to be viable? Is it the kind of action that can increase uptake of renewable energy? So at the national level, we have some of those activities going on. And then at the county level, in a, um, we're working on capacity developments. As um, Joe mentioned earlier, one of the challenges is we found with um, implementing some of this project is that there isn't enough technical capacity at the local level. So through some capacity training on project development, on climate financing, we are trying to upskill the, the city staff as well as, you know, getting the private sector also involved in what's going on at the county level, how the processes are done at the county level, so that all at once the entire um, project team is moving forward. We've also done um, some workshops with the county to get the vision, where exactly does the county want to go in terms of their uptake of renew renewable energy and energy efficiency, and set targets and plan for actions. But you know, a number of these things is not just about setting the targets, it's the main crux of the matter is when it comes down to implementation. And how do we get this implemented? We're looking at developing proposals, bankable proposals, but at, um, in tandem with the community, in tandem with the um, national level stakeholders, and then we can now put this forward and attract funding to fund some of the projects um, within, within the county. So in terms of looking at the different areas of alignment, we mentioned that there are some activities that are focused on the national level, and there are some activities that are focused on the county level. So along, um, for the national level engagements, we've been engaging with stakeholders, as I mentioned, to bring them on board so that we all have these, at least if not the exact vision, a common vision of where we want to get to. So bringing the national level stakeholders on board right from the inception of the project is one of the ways that we're seeking to align and make sure that we're all in line with the same um, objectives of achieving that uptake to uh, more renewable energy within the energy mix. For this, we're also looking at basically th three sectors for um, the uptake of energy. We're looking at electricity supply and access, we're looking at clean cooking, and we're looking at transport. So many of the policies that we're looking at and the, the infrastructure that we're developing and the projects 
um, proposals we will be working on towards um, the later part of this project will be geared around those three main sectors and how we can increase investment, how we can attract funding, how which low-level um, solutions can we employ or readily deploy within at the community level to encourage more um, investment and more renewable action projects being implemented. And we're not doing this alone. We're working with other development partners who are also doing similar work to push this forward. And then at the local level, mentioned we're engaging with the local level, empowering the city staff so that they have a better idea of how this project um, runs. If you're developing a project proposal, for instance, it will be better for the city staff to also have a good understanding of what the project is. Right from project inception, they've identified their vision, they've identified the actions that they need to get there. But are some of these actions, those that can attract funding or those that we can push forward to, to get implemented at the national level. So we also um, developing capacity um, across the entire chain for the um, local level um, for the city staff at the local level. Then one of the things we are looking at, um, which we haven't done, but which will be um, engaged on along the project is localizing, domesticating the national policies. For instance, there's the um, green economy strategy and implementation plan. Some of the objectives of that um, implementation plan is around reviewing feeding tariffs and um, net metering. But at the local, at the county level, there is um, not much influence the county government, for instance, can have around what feed-in tariffs the national government or the Ministry of Energy is going to put in place. So what we're doing is to identify which of those policies and plans at the national level that can be domesticated, and then the local government has an area of influence over and can actually put in some action or put in some projects or um, get those towards investment. For instance, for under the same guess, if there's promoting the use of bioenergy and um, at households and public institutions. That is something that's easily, more easily within the reach of the county government and they can influence going forward in um, you know, increasing their uptake of local, of um, renewable energy solutions and potentials that have been identified for um, Kisumu County and the other learning counties. Now, so a number of, um, along the line, a number of things have been identified. Some have been mentioned earlier as well. One of the commonest ones is around financial um, challenges. As it is, the, the counties get their funding from the national level. But the issue is that same funding is also going into health, is also going into education, is also going to um, county staff salaries and your road maintenance projects, so many other projects. So how do we now get to in have an increased um, portion of these allocations for renewable energy and energy efficiency projects? That's some of the um, challenges that we've identified so far. And, looking forward to also hearing from others how we can face these challenges and increase the uptake of, of um, funding or allocations for local level projects. Um, then in terms of um, incentives, there's... Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, then let me just... There are just also regulatory, um, regulatory challenges, um, enforcement of standards, a number of users of RE Technologies complain about the low standards. They use a solar home kit for one or two weeks and then it goes kaput and then what happens next? So there aren't those standards in place to support that transition to renewable energy. And then in terms of institutional challenges, there are a few up there. I'll just mention on grid infrastructure, how if you're increasing the um, supply of renewable energy, but the grid infrastructure isn't ready to take up that additional um, supply, maybe because it's outdated or the, the transmission network is just not strong enough to bring in, um, to take up that additional RE being supplied. How do we go about addressing some of these challenges? I'll wrap up there now and um, <laughs> hand it over to Hastings. And yeah, thank you very much. That's it from thank you. us. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, the question is, can, can we upscale this? Yes. What? From this, what she's saying is, yes, we need to get the policy alignment right, uh, institutional coordination right, regulatory frameworks right, and of course the financing and the technology. Can we do that? Some people have asked me, can really African cities take a radical transition to renewable energy? 
And my answer has always been yes, bold yes. And I do so uh, because what we need are the no-nonsense approach like what she has uh, shared here. And this is frank talk, so I will use hard words. You know, what I find nonsensical, and I said this last, last week uh, in, uh, in Egypt, is we have a continent, uh, I will speak as a politician, my fellow Africans, we have, <laughs> we have a continent that has about 600 million people, for goodness sake, that don't have access to electricity. And yet, the figures that I was given last week in one of my speaking notes is that we have 600, about 650,000 terawatt hours per year of solar energy in this continent. We have about 480,000 terawatt hours per year of wind energy in, on this continent. Is that not nonsensical? Let's do the right things. Let's take a non-nonsense approach. Let's get to 100% renewable energy. With that, can I, go, can I go to Regina? Regina, you basically are recognizing the fact that sometimes in a rush to get makeshift infrastructure in Africa, we miss the open spaces. The future is now, that's what Michael has said, and the vision that we have seen is that the future city of Africa needs to have open and green spaces. We saw the transformation. Can you tell us how you, what you're doing in Kibera, which has been characterized by informality and all that, but you're doing some things there. Share, share that with us. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, it seems that the theme of the conference from yesterday has revolved around superheroes. Um, there was reflection and mention of uh, Wakanda Forever, Black Panther yesterday, and today Michael has pushed the boat um, with the Afro-urban superheroes. So we know that in the superhero narrative, you need a good origin story. And that's what this picture is for me, a good origin story. So this image speaks to the founding of KDI and the foundationing of the Kibera Public Space Project. It was done in 2006 by one of KDI's founders, Arthur Adair, to capture their thinking way back then, um, when they sought to answer the question of how can design carry out urban transformation how can we address the challenges such as flooding, the need for public spaces and sustainable income in underserved communities? Positing then at that time that investment in small scale interventions together with the community could contribute to both benefit to the community and the environment, and in particular the river ecosystem. And because of this and their thinking then, um, here we are today. So in a nutshell, um, that's who we are. I feel very blessed to work with amazing people and communities, superheroes no less, across Kibera, Kenya, and KDI um, to change my city, my country, Kidogo Kidogo, so little by little, um, through building productive public spaces and infrastructure, both physical but also civic um, in the people, in forgotten and underserved and under-resourced places. The dream for us is to advance equity and activate the unrealized potential in neighborhoods and cities. So like many informal settlements, um, Kibera is both a site of extremely challenging conditions, but also of innovation, ingenuity, and low-impact living. Home to more than 300,000 people, it plays a key role in Nairobi's informal, informal economy and affordable housing markets. So we all know what the challenges of the informal settlements are, so I won't go into that. But when you add into it the effects of climate events like severe and unpredictable rainy seasons, often resulting in floods, bringing destruction, disease, and large impacts on broader ecosystems and economies. Nevertheless, Kibera is home. It is uh, hopeful and it is rising. And the Kibera Public Space Project for us is a direct response to the disenfranchisement and injustice rooted in our colonial heritage, no less, and often repeated by government in its informal settlement development policies and initiatives. So from Arthur's sketch in 2006 to actual um, sites, Kibera public space projects, from theory to practice and implementing sustainable infrastructure transitions at a small scale. So starting with people and built on the principles of participation, integration, and network change. Please remember those three words. Participation, integration, and network change. It has modeled how people-focused design can enhance a community's socioeconomic status, holistic well-being, strengthen cohesion, and give agencies for communities to demand their rights from duty bearers, as well as many other good things. 
So that's Nairobi Dam um, before 2008. And actually, that's the area, the community um, they were speaking to. So the sketch that came earlier, um, the list of organizations there, those are the communities that um, the founders spoke to at that time. Nairobi Dam is adjacent to Silanga Village, where the consultations happened. It used to be a place in my childhood where you could swim, you could fish, you could sail boats. It was a place of recreation. You could have picnics uh, on the side of the lake. However, over the years, um, because of lack of waste of management in Kibera, amongst many other reasons, the dam has become heavily polluted and still is heavily polluted. But from the dialogues and workshops and conversation, the needs of the community were distilled and prioritized. And flooding was one of the major challenges for the people living around the dam and the need for a safe space for children and adults to play and socialize. Something so simple that we take for granted, space to just sit and be outside in the open. So those emerged as some of the important uh, needs of the community then. So um, after the conversations, then we went into construction, co-design, co-planning, co-construction, and the site has now been handed over to one of the groups that was in the consultations, the new Nairobi Dam community, um, and they currently run the site. As you can see, it pulls together physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, so a place for them to meet, to hang out, to interact, to plan, uh, but also socioeconomic activities. So they have urban agriculture, they have the hall which they hire which brings income, um, toilets which you can use and that brings income, which is then channeled back into maintenance, and of course um, economic uh, improvement for the communities that live in the area. Uh, just another example in Katokera, which is also in Kibera. Um, so this, there was a bridge that was crossing from Kibera side into Langata side. Um, it often got flooded and became risky for people to cross. There was also no sanitation. There was um, erosion of the riverbank. And so similarly, we had um, consultations with the community. Um, eventually got around to planning, co-design, co-instruction, and um, the community is now running that. And it is run by a local group called Kibera Action Group. And similarly, it also provides a physical, social, and economic infrastructure um, with all those services provided. Now, it's not always smooth sailing. Uh, one of the things that we had uh, constructed with the community group at that point was a greenhouse, which you can't see in the picture, um, but we have since lost the greenhouse. Um, and it was grabbed um, by one of the pressure groups. I, I heard somebody say that in Nigeria, they're called uh, Active Boys, Action yeah, Boys. Area boys, yes, so similar thing. Um, but this project is unique because for once we were able to work very closely with county government, the local elected MCA, even with those pressure groups until the point one of them grabbed the, the greenhouse um, to actually get the project up and going and even get connection for the toilets into um, the system, you know, the, the sewerage service. Um, which is now broken, but we're in conversations with the um, sewerage service to reconnect that again, so we are working on that. So that's why this was unique, because we had grown to be able to work with other stakeholders, local government included, um, to be able to realize the visions of the community. Um, the KPSPs um, have also provided opportunity to test and innovate. So this is um, our last uh, public space, which is run by a youth group in Makina area, Vijana Osafi na Maendeleo Vuma, and it became an opportunity to innovate and to test using soda crates to reduce flooding in this area. Um, so this allows the water to seep down uh, rather than stay on top and flood into the neighboring houses, um, and also posing a risk of disease amongst other things. However, as I said, it's not always rosy um, and, and sunny. So one of the local leaders has built trenches around the area, which were not done well, pose a risk for the local community. There's not much the group could do, even with their advocacy. And so while they have a lovely site, when you go outside, there's still a problem of waste management. Um, that MC has been voted out, so maybe there's an opportunity to re-engage. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the site looks like now. Um, so the KPSP of uh, 16 years has grown from one public space on reclaimed land to a network of 11 community um, spaces across Kibera. And with every site, there's been learning and testing of new innovations. Um, they have doubled the amount of formal space in Kibera and increased access to sanitation, play, and gathering for lots of people supporting climate resilience and uh, a network of 253 community leaders um, and uh, an infrastructure that you can continue to build on top. So one of the things we're piloting now is also Wi-Fi in some of the sites and how that can bridge the digital divide. Um, we also recognize that professionals need to practice differently, to be doing things differently and work across disciplines. Um, so as I start to conclude, how has this been possible? Our approach has been participation, 
um, remember what I told you before, participation, um, integration, and network change. So participation by connecting with community members and their priorities. Um, those experiencing the complexities of life in Kibera have a right to participate in decisions that affect them. Participation enables us to build on local knowledge, increase social cohesion, and help community members grow their capacity to change. Um, integration, connecting different strategies to create multi-sectoral intervention. Design alone is not enough. At the same time, design can really set the stage for transformational so social and economic initiatives. And the KPSP projects all integrate physical infrastructure with economic generating activities and social cultural programming, which I've already shared about. And then finally, network change, which is really about connecting community members with each other, uh, with government and agency actors, and making these connections is essential because otherwise projects remain in silos. So establishing the network creates new opportunities and robust structures for city community collaboration. Um, so after all these years, uh, it is our hope that the med model is flexible enough to adapt, scale, and to travel. And we've made efforts to share that, to document it, and to advocate for participatory infrastructure development. Um, recently, um, there was a call for proposals for the urban public initiatives in Nairobi. And when we saw the call for proposal, we were struck by how the proposed um, model closely follows the logic of KPSP. So we applied and we were accepted. And um, this would be the first time that um, we are working closely with um, our partners, the Mungano Alliance. Hi, Jane. Um, and working very closely with Nairobi County government and national government on a government program, the Kenya Informal Settlement Improvement Project. So this could be the opportunity to scale up. We're excited, but it also makes us very nervous because we've not been this close to government. But we like the idea that planning public space, social, cultural layer alongside hard infrastructure is an idea we've been pushing and government seems to be picking it up. And so we wait to see. We've already started to experience certain challenges. Um, KISIP has been funded by World Bank, so if there are World Bank people here, and the way that they have interacted with government staff is also making it quite difficult for us to inter interact with government staff. So they start to demand for allowances to go to the field, transport, lunch, because that's what they're used to with the World Bank, and they know this is World Bank funded, AFD funded, and that's not the way we've been doing our work. So already we are starting to have frictions, and it's only the beginning of the project. So if people have ideas on how we can have smooth sailing, um, we welcome that. But the building blocks that uh, must be in place to ensure success and mitigate conflicts, um, we have some of them, some we're still figuring out. Um, the first one is perseverance and staying put. So staying put in the places we have been in um, is key to building legitimacy, trust, and change. And it takes a long time to get that kind of trust, bring people together, um, but it's worth it for ownership and success of the project. Urban transformation should be grounded in a place and it's a long-term game. As one of my colleagues, who is a founder of KDI, says, um, we will not stop when we are tired, we will stop when we are done. But now that we are moving out of Kibera, you know, we don't have 16 years luxury to, to build trust. We have to start on the go, and projects are one year, two year, three years. So we have to rely a lot on our partners who have established a presence there, or we start from scratch. And so it's also a steep learning curve for us. But we are lucky to have partners um, from the Mungana Alliance, AMT, and SDI who can help us figure out the areas they're in and the areas where they're not in. Our, we figure it out ourselves. So can we do the KPSP process the same way while still appreciating partners' processes? Politics and power, you cannot separate um, design from politics and power, especially when land and exploitation, historical and present day, is at the heart of urban development. And in Kenya, land is very emotive. So friends will give you stories of having been chased away from site by big gangs with machetes. Um, sometimes we've managed to reclaim dump sites and the next day come to find that somebody has built a house there. And those are challenges we will continue to, um, we will continue to face. We've even lost um, one of our sites that was demolished um, for government infrastructure that is currently not working. So it is one step forward, two steps back, but we must remain attentive to interests and developments. Then thirdly, centering voices less heard, people have solutions to their problems. And particularly centering women and children's voices has led us to practical solutions, um, such as adjacent laundry pads and play areas, enabling mothers to balance childcare, chores, and socializing. But we also realize we've not been as inclusive as we could be. So how do we design more inclusively to include other voices we have forgotten? Um, and can we keep quiet on sites of injustice that might not be directly um, what we're addressing? Um, then linking um, various movements together becomes important because of solidarity. And um, I think the, the last thing I'll say about some of the lessons we've learned, learning by doing, but also being able to learn from others becomes important and evidence. 
Um, how else can we learn? Can we learn from government? Are there resources available for us to fail? Because you have to fail to learn sometimes. And can we finance this work locally? Because a lot of it has been dependent on funding from outside of the country. So linking to the earlier conversation and conversations that are coming forward. So finally, um, as our ancestors said, or as we say in Kiswahili, haba na haba kujaza, ujaza kidogo, ujaza kibaba. Little by little, we fill the pot. So we're trying to do little by little, and hopefully the pot will get full one day. Asante. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Regina. I would like us to have a conversation. What uh, four colleagues here have successfully demonstrated is that we can actually transition to implementation on the ground. It's not easy, but it's possible. And I would like us to have a conversation. Yes, you can ask questions, but I would like us to focus on really commenting or sharing experiences in terms of what you are doing in your respective spaces to basically ensure that we can implement infrastructure transitions in Africa. You know, I, I want Edgar, and just allow me a little bit, I want Edgar that I'm going to bring disillusionment and anger in this room. And uh, he, he allowed me. And I want to use that anger and disillusionment to actually engage in self-introspection. When you look at uh, the, this presentation and you see before and after, it gives you hope. It, uh, it transitions you from so many problems in this world to jamming, jamming, I want to jam with you. Because you see, you, see, you see solutions. Can we say the same? on some of the commitments that we make. Can we see before and after? I don't subscribe to the conspiracy of success, where success is vocalized, but you actually don't see that success on the ground. He, she was talking about informal settlements, and this is one injustice that I get emotional about, and we are talking about frank talk, we are talk, talking about uh, storytelling, because I am a product of an informal settlement in Blanta called Ndirande, but it's, this particular pocket is called Malabada, which is closer, a closer translation is a graveyard. So to some extent, I am a product of some graveyard looking settlement. And it's not easy. So we cannot afford uh, to remain silent, as you have said, at the site of injustice. How do we speed up implementation so that we can deal with informality in African cities? African cities are characterized by informality, whether it's informal settlements or informal business. How do we do, deal with that? Can we have a conversation? Uh, is it possible? Um, I, I see a hand, Trevor, would like to come in. And I see you there. Can we get the mic? Thank you very much, Hastings, and thanks to the panel for uh, very enriching uh, presentations. I'd like to, I'd like to raise uh, uh, or ask Mohammed to unpack a mystery that he has touched on, because the mystery is not a uniquely Nairobi or Kenyan mystery. It's a way in which we spend on student accommodation. And if you rate it per square meter for some for a accommodation that people will spend three, four years in, we cannot match it with family accommodation. Family accommodation frequently is informalized. Student accommodation is highly formal, highly expensive, and is it because of the voice of students? You go around this campus and you find exactly the same issue. So in your ACORN project versus uh, the rest of, 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 of uh, uh, residential housing for families, uh, why does the contradiction arise and why do we keep, uh, uh, as Hastings said, the success of the student accommodation project as opposed to what happens in the lives of ordinary families? Thanks. Great. 
I will take uh, like maybe three to four questions and then let the panel respond. Let's do it quick. We, we, we don't have much time. Let's, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Akhilu from uh, the World Resources Institute. Um, so thank you very much for like shedding light on this really perfect idea. Uh, so like I have to tell a story. Like I was discussing like five, six years back with the minister of one of the housing, urban development and housing. So they introduced lots of initiatives, housing projects, condominiums, land lease, all those options to address um, housing. But uh, the parallel thing that informality is still there, never addressed. And I ask it why? Oh, oh, we tried our best. But where, where are those lands? Where are those houses? Are not affordable, like housing for the low income people. It has never been for the low income, even for the middle income. It has been grabbed by some, but still slum mushrooming, like informality going on, parallel, like the housing we got, we heard from Ahmed, and, and also the Regina shared informality. These two things are really a paradox. Lots of policies, actions mm. on the ground. I, I really like the initiative that you presented. It, it's really a bold one. Why is still informality really mushrooming? I, I just, it's doable, it's doable. And, how, and then linking it with the, the bigger agenda and, 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 and linking it with data, why with research, why is, what's, what's wrong with these all actions going on in Africa? So it's still 60%, 70% informality has been the history and now even the present action in, in Africa. We've been listening it since our university time. Now it's still there. So, and how can we aggregate, link these two? And I want to also connect it with the, the bankable uh, plan, the bigger picture of connecting the two paradoxes, the projects going on, and the challenge is still moving on. How can we link this into the process? And I just wanted also to ask, uh, did you get a kind of chance, why this slam, why this informality? Yes, we know, we all know from the research we can, we can refer. Why not sort it out? So that's really what I would like to do, like, like pause, but it's still doable. And an agenda of, if with the why, then why only, is it only Nairobi? I just want to also pause. As a city, as a system, and the bigger cities are the one really getting this hard, really uh, challenge, not just secondary. So what about linking those, getting okay. like some points? And I wanted to also see, okay. yeah, just one, one point. Yes. Okay, one point of um, getting the will of the government in addressing the informality. Because the government, the cities, they don't want that thing to be absorbed into the city system. Just I wanted to hear that, thank you. Fabulous, thank you so much. I've taken one from here, one from here, one from here. Okay, Manuel, it feels good this whole informality, inform, sorry, informal conversation thing. Um, I can now call Mayor Araujo, Manuel. Manuel, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. You know, I want to really like to share a bit of my frustration too. I think we are both frustrated people, as he said. And uh, we are coming here from the Angover from Sharm el Sheikh. We have been there in, in different panels and mm. trying to make sense of what are we talking about. But my main question now is becoming are we talking about the same city? My question is to me, is the inability of the post colonial states, by state I mean national and, and local, to grasp the reality, the anger, the anxiety of the majority of the people and try to develop it into a, a project to answer that expectation. I'll put it in other words. If we look at our be mayors, be governors, be presidents, they're all living, at the, or most of them, just to 
exclude a few of them. They're still using the former house of the former governor general, of the former mayor, I mean, in the colonial period. But the cities, the way cities are conceived, are built, reflects the value of the, a given society. Are we today responding to the needs of our people in terms of which kind of cities are we talking about? This thing of informality, are we talking informality according to what I thought or I expected that to have been the new concept of cities or are we trying to reproduce the old model? Isn't here the con any contradiction? Is it the same city? The colonial city is equal, is meant, is designed, and serves the same purpose as the cost colonial city? Are we trying to build new cities as the former ones? Or we need to rethink the kind of seeds that we need to develop. To me, I think this is where the whole debate sometimes loses. Because we are trying to design a New York in Kibera. I don't know if it works. Because the concept under which New York was built probably is not. Or has nothing or very few things to do with where we are coming. Who lives in our cities? Okay. There are people who are pushed from the rural areas, be it by civil war, be it by anger, by poverty, whatever. Their level, can they really live on a 12th building store with an elevator? Is that city that we want to build? All right. Thank you. What's the ideal city for Africa? Um, can I go back to the panelists? Michael, Muhammad, Aziza, and Regina, would you like to respond? I want to start with you, Michael, because you are very pro provocative about the future that is now. Take it from there. Informality is a bit of a blunt instrument, I think, because, of course, in the space that we call informal, there are many formalities. And in the formal space, many of the transactions are informal, handshakes, favors, cronism. So I, I think we need to um, nuance our narration of the formal and, and the informal. And what we need to do is harness, as I say, the improvisatory, adaptive, responsive capacities of the informal and lend an interoperability and capacity for interconnection, because the challenge is, is one of scale. Right? I mean, this is the challenge we're finding in our project in, in Port Harcourt. Very well-intentioned, making a difference, real impact, means a lot to a lot of people, but totally inadequate to the scale of the challenge. So in a place like Nigeria, the, the macro-level utility scale solutions are too big. The capacity isn't there. The micro-level solutions, solar lamps, even rooftop solar, it, it, too small. Even in aggregate, they can't scale to city level. So how do you scale? And, and for me, I think it's, it's the neighborhood. If you look at how cities are actually being built, it's at neighborhood level. They have actual capacity, representative governance structures. They raise levies. They can manage. So if you can develop infrastructures that can be implemented and managed at a neighborhood level and then interconnected, then you can scale. So as I said, the next big thing is, is, is not a massive thing. It's a concert of medium-sized things. Right. Mohammed, your views, please. Um, Relating to the first question, uh, pertaining to the kind of uh, paradox in terms of student accommodation and uh, large-scale um, housing delivery, uh, from my experience and perspective, I look at it in terms of um, there, there's growing need in terms of student accommodation. We have universities, tertiary institutions across African cities, which they have increased number of enrollment, but the delivery of the units 
of student accommodation is ever dwindling by the day. So what we've realized the fact is that, of course, first and foremost, there is no capacity to have financing that will be able to deliver at scale with the student accommodation, which makes it much more expensive. And also another aspect is the fact that um, the student accommodation, it's, it's a niche area which there is large opportunity, kind of opportunity to be replicated across African cities. So I'm looking at it in, in terms of, you know, if IRES, like what was done there in Nairobi by Econ, we can be able to understand the dynamics. I think that will go a long way. The rate that was done there was the first, and in several African countries, even the regulations, the laws, you know, the supporting engagement that will enhance real investment, uh, investment trust is not even there. So by kind of, you know, scaling up gradually, having the policies, the regulations, I think that will go a long way. That's uh, for the student accommodation aspect. Then the other um, aspect in terms of the question asked, the, you know, um, the reality in terms of um, the ever-growing need for housing and then the limited number of units being delivered. We have all seen the numbers. There's growing number of rural urban migration. There's housing deficit growing by the day. And then at the other end, we need to understand the elephant in the room is understanding affordability. That's very, very important. All this while, the discussion has been, okay, what is affordable? If I ask built environment professionals, what's affordable? What is affordable in Johannesburg? Is it the same as what is affordable in Lomi, in Togo? Definitely no. What is affordable in Nairobi? Is it also what is affordable in, 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 in Jamena, in Chad? No. But the global understanding of what we understand is that if once you are spending anything less than 30% of your income, where you're servicing mortgage or servicing your, your rent, then it's affordable. Then we're not looking at it from the holistic perspective. If it's affordable for the household, is it feasible for the developer? Because it's the cycle. So that's where there is a missing link. So that's an area where Shelter Africa, um, through a, a, a policy research and partnerships unit, said that, okay, this understanding of affordability, it might be affordable, spending less than 30%, but you might be spending much more transporting yourself from where the opportunity from where the housing unit is to where the economic opportunities are. So we, did, we developed a housing for a calculator to really talk into that. So just to you know, kind of wrap it up in that aspect is to say that we need to really be hands-on practical and we need to understand the moving dynamics. Most specifically now we're having high you know, inflation, high interest rates, and that's a reality. And we need to deliver this housing unit going forward. Thank you, thank you so much. Aziza. Okay, um, a few contributions around that is rather than maybe um, like, um, sorry, like Michael added, if we're looking at a transition f towards 100% um, renewable energy, for instance, we could take it on a modular scale. Look at what solutions can be deployed in informal settlements. In, uh, for, for this project, for instance, a number of informal settlements and low-income households use these um, local lamps. They call them Nyangile lamps, and they are just a weak, uh, dipped in recycled, maybe beverage containers, all sorts, modified to provide lighting. So solutions that can suit that kind of um, community or that kind of settlement will be scaling them up to having solar kits that are affordable and small scale that they can ease that transition. And then if you now move um, to more formalized settlements like residential estates, where we can have solutions um, around to increase the uptake of RE could be things like having street lighting within the estates. These estates are usually a bit more structured. They could have the chairman of the residential estates. They could have small organizations organizations or committees within the estate that work on particular things. So we can now start looking at different projects that can be deployed in different communities according to their affordability, according to the kind of formal or informality of those settlements and begin to see what solutions can be adapted at different scales to increase that transition from depending on maybe polluting fuels or polluting lighting solutions and now transition to the cleaner, um, renewable energy equivalent, also based on what resources are available within those communities. If it's geothermal on a large scale, if it's solar, if it's wind, whatever potentials that particular community has, and then now begin to look at how we can scale those up um, little by little all over the, the country. Yeah. Thank you. Regina, to the point, you'll be the last speaker. Okay, so we all know that raise and build, uh, rebuild strategies have not worked that have been deployed by government in the past. And in fact, um, this approach towards development in informal settlements has um, 
not been taken up well by the communities, but has also caused further marginalization and caused further injustice. Um, largely because there's been no consultation, there's been no thinking about incorporating how communities already exist in that informal space and taking that into the formalized space. So I like the ideas of not addressing the informality, but working with the informality and dignifying it. And I like the idea of rethinking and reimagining cities and spaces um, to then incorporate that. So we have these conversations, um, I, I think, at work around um, access to legal water, illegal water, legal electricity, illegal electricity. And there's a gray area which we've discovered of informal water and informal access to electricity. And negotiating with um, the various powers that be, how people can still access those services, that informality, and how that can be formalized. Um, I like the idea and the work um, that has been pushed by the Mungano Alliance, SDI and AMT, particularly in Mukuru informal settlement, because they started from the informality and creating demand in that informality for planning, for services um, to be brought there. And from that demand, government responded and responded in a way that allowed them to incorporate both the informality of the demands of the community, um, but also formal things. So formal things like uh, planning of the space, access to water, numbering of houses and things like that, but informality in how the groups are organized, how they manage services like simple sewers, uh, amongst many others. So it is possible, and I think the challenge to reimagine and rethink the city is something that is up for us, um, and we can take up the challenge. Thank you so much. Colleagues, that's what we had time for. Let's continue the conversations during break, but also let's, say you, let's continue the conversations in the, in the coming sessions. Um, let's uh, let's uh, recognize the agency of the... Uh, the, the problem and really, really uh, transition to implementation using the, some of the best practices that have been shared uh, to upscale them and replicate them to actually achieve the future city that we want in Africa. Can we just give the panel a round of applause? So, two, two housekeeping matters. Um, and Michael couldn't help himself. Yeah, I, I know we're not supposed to sell our projects, but given your name, Chikoko, I, I have to give you a Chikoko T-shirt <laughs> from, 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 from our crew, Imani, who took a lot of the pictures. Thank you. Okay, so after lunch, we get to see uh, Hastings' pets uh, in the Chikoko T-shirt. For his daughter. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, but just so we're back on schedule with time, but it does mean your lunch uh, time deficit has increased to 10 minutes. So please reconvene on time uh, for the next session yes. uh, that, that, that will start after lunch. So, and, and enjoy lunch. Thank you. <laughs>